Social Science and Policy Forum. And uh, I have a few housekeeping matters to take care of before I, I um, make an introduction. Um, this is uh, this workshop is um, eligible for CLE credit if you are an attorney looking for your continuing legal education credit. Uh, if you are um, uh, doing this for CLE credit, um, you need to fill out various forms that are in the back of the room. They'll be available after uh, the workshop is over at 1.30. So please don't hesitate uh, to do so if you're eligible for CLE credits. Um, are we ready to go, Matt? Yeah. Great. So. Um, the Social Science and Policy Forum is a university-wide initiative to bring together policy-relevant social scientists, policymakers, uh, and the public to discuss pressing issues of our time. This year's theme, Immigration and Citizenship, uh, is, has brought uh, a really an extraordinary group of scholars to campus uh, this year, uh, as well as policymakers, including Demetrius Papa Dimitriou, the head of the Migration Policy Institute, political scientists, demographers, historians, uh, and more. Um, this afternoon's workshop, uh, which is featuring uh, Professor Maria Cristina Garcia from Cornell, who you'll get a formal introduction to in a moment, uh, is co-sponsored uh, by the Social Science and Policy Forum, as well as the Trustees Council of Penn Women, the Department of History, the Latin American and Latino Studies Program, and the Penn Program on Democracy, Constitutionalism, and Citizenship. I want to thank all of those uh, units uh, for um, sponsoring this event and also for being part of what makes Penn such a vital interdisciplinary institution. Um, I'm now going to turn uh, the floor over to uh, Professor Emilio Parado, who is the co-director of Latin American and Latino Studies and the chair of the Department of Sociology and a member of the Social Science and Policy Forum Advisory Committee that has been putting together um, this year's uh, program on immigration and citizenship and many, many other things, uh, a man of immense talent and, and um, boundless energy. So I turn the floor over to you, uh, Emilio, to introduce our panel. Okay. Thank you, Tom, and uh, thank you, everybody, for coming, for being here today. Uh, it's a pleasure for, for us to have uh, three panelists uh, to discuss uh, refugee issues in particular, more generally immigration issues and legal aspects related to immigration. Immigration is very much uh, at the forefront of the discussion in the U.S. today, so I think this is going to be a, this a great opportunity to broadly talk about these issues with a, with a focus on refugees and policy, which is some, something that's not always gets discussed enough in proposing immigration legislation. So I'm going to very briefly introduce the panelists today, and, uh, and uh, they're going to make a, a, a few remarks, five, ten minutes, and uh, we are very much looking forward to an open discussion of these issues. So I'm going to start with uh, Judith Bursting. Baker, who is the executive director of the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society of Pennsylvania. Prior to that, she ran the public service program at the, at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Judy has received a long list of recognitions, and I'm only going to mention a few for brevity. She was named Honorary Fellow of Penn Law School in 1998. In 2004, she received the Mary Philbrook Award from Rutgers Camden Law School for Public Interest and have received certificates of honor and appreciation from the African Cultural Alliance, Liberian Association of Philadelphia, and the Equal Justice Award from Community Legal Services. She teaches immigration law at Philadelphia Community College and is an active member of the Philadelphia chapter of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Uh, Fernando Chang Mui is the Thomas O'Boyle Lecturer in Law at the University of Pennsylvania School of Law where he teaches refugees law and policy. He also teaches courses on immigration and social work at the Graduate School of Social Policy and Practice. Uh, he's former assistant dean and equal opportunity officer at Swarthmore College. Among many other accomplishments, he's the founding director of the Liberty Center for Survivors of Torture and he served as legal officer with two United Nations agencies dealing with refugees and human rights. Uh, finally, Maria Cristina Garcia is the Howard Newman Professor of American Studies at Cornell University. She studies refugees, immigrants, exiles, and transnationals in the Americas. Uh, her first book, Havana, USA, examined the migration of Cuba to the United States, to the U.S. after Fidel Castro took power in 1959. Her second book, Seeking Refuge, 
uh, is a study of the individuals, groups, and organizations that responding to the Central America refugee crisis of the 1988s and 1990s and helped shape refugee policy throughout North America. Garcia has been chosen as a fellow for 2013-14 by the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. and she's visiting us from, from D.C. today. So, uh, I think the idea is to uh, both put refugee policy in historical context and discuss current issues today. So, I think my, Maria Christine is going to start with... Uh, thank you, thank you, Thanks. Um, I plan to talk briefly about the history, the evolution of refugee policy, just in a few minutes, a very brief immersion into this history. Um, The U.S. federal government first recognized refugees as a distinct immigrant category in 1948, you could say, um, through the passage of these two pieces of legislation, the Displaced Persons Act of 1948 and the Refugee Relief Act of 1953. Uh, we brought in some approximately six, uh, 600,000 people, uh, primarily from Southern and Eastern Europe, as part of a plan to assist in Europe's post-war recovery. Most of these people would not have been admitted otherwise because of the strict national origins quotas that were in place in the United States until 1965. As the Cold War evolved, the executive branch deemed it in the national interest to bring in people who were displaced by the spread of communism, and the Attorney General routinely, uh, routinely used the parole authority granted to him by the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952 to bring in hundreds of, thousand, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of refugees and displaced persons from the communist bloc. Uh, during the Cold War, the overwhelming majority of our refugees came from three countries, the Soviet Union, Vietnam, and Cuba. In 1980, uh, well, the United States did not sign the 1951 uh, UN uh, Convention on the Status of, of Refugees, but it did sign the 1967 Protocol where we recognized that we had an international obligation to assist refugees. And also we recognized uh, that refugees were entitled to certain rights and protections, including that of non refoulement no force return to dangerous and repressive conditions. 13 years later, 13 years after we signed the protocol, uh, Congress passed the 1980 Refugee Act, where we adopted the UN definition of refugee that you see here on the screen, and we also made refugee admissions a permanent feature of American immigration law. And a refugee um, is now defined, as you see on the screen, as a person who owing uh, to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion is outside of their country of nationality, etc. You could read for, for yourselves. And since 1980, the executive branch, in co consultation with Congress, comes up with an annual refugee quota and assigns percentages of that quota to different regions of the world, depending on that year's national priorities and humanita uh, humanitarian concerns. And until the last decade, a percentage of the refugee quota was reserved specifically for asylum seekers, for, for people who asked for protection from the United States at a U.S. port of entry. But since the 1980s, we've had such a growing number of people who are asking for asylum at a port of entry, and it's created a huge backlog, um, tying up our immigration courts. And so consequently, we no longer reserve just a, a portion, a percentage of the refugee quota for asylum seekers. Rather, we assign uh, the overall asylum seekers to the overall refugee quota. And perhaps we can go into that in, in, um, in more depth during the Q&A. Um, you know, ironically, the year that we signed, uh, that we Congress passed the, um, the U.S., uh, the, the 1980 Refugee Act, um, and uh, where we adopted the U.N. definition of refugee, um, UN officials routinely admitted that their definition, that um, their definition of refugee, no longer applied to the realities of today's world. Most people who fled uh, their countries did not do so because they were individually persecuted. Um, they fled because of a generalized climate of violence. They were displaced by the violence in their home country, or by natural disaster, by famine, by any of a number of, of conditions. And, uh, and so refugee advocates for a very long time have uh, said that a more realistic definition of refugee can be found 
for example, in the Organization of African Unity, in 19, uh, there was uh, a regional convention in 1969, uh, which uh, uh, recognizes that a general climate of violence contributes to the displacement of people. And here it is. Uh, uh, a section of that convention which applies, which defines what a refugee is. Um, there's another, also more expansive definition of refugee um, in the 1984 Cartagena Declaration um, as part of the, the peace discussions in Central America to end the wars in Central America in the 1980s, which also recognizes that a general climate of violence can contribute to the displacement of people and create refugee-like conditions that, that force people to move across borders. But here in the United States, uh, for a very long time, and, and I guess you could say that even today, the burden of proof is placed on the individual refugee and asylum seeker to prove um, to the United States, to, to our immigration and, um, and refugee and asylum bureaucracy, that uh, he or she has been singled out for persecution. The burden of proof is still placed on the individual. We're, we are seeing some changes in the post-Cold War period. Um, uh, since the end of the Cold War, the courts have generally, uh, they, uh, they've, they've recognized, um, uh, well, we've seen a, a revamping of, of the refugee and the asylum bureaucracy, and, and we've seen that uh, the, the courts are more willing to recognize that, um, that a general climate of violence can contribute to displacement and, and force people to cross borders. And, and the courts have increasingly um, uh, recognize that a petitioner, even if a petitioner cannot prove that he or she has been individually singled out for persecution, if they are able to prove that people very similarly situated to them have experienced violence because of their political advocacy, because of their gender, because of their sexuality, they have been able to secure asylum even though they may not be able to prove that they themselves have been individually singled out for persecution. And and the final comment that I want to make before I, I pass, um, pass over the, uh, the mic to my colleagues, uh, the clicker to my colleagues, um, just three points that I want to bring up and, and that perhaps we can go um, into in, further, uh, in, in, in greater depth during the Q&A. Um, what I've noticed since, uh, what most of us have noticed since, uh, since the end of the Cold War, there have been three major developments that have shaped refugee policy. The first, as I said earlier, is the growing number of asylum seekers. When uh, Congress passed the Refugee Act, they never imagined that there would be so many people asking for asylum at a port of entry. During the early Cold War, not more than 75,000 people um, per year asked for asylum. But since the 1980s, because of the wars in Central America, we routinely receive over 100,000 applications for asylum per year. And we have a, a very large backlog at present of people who are, who are waiting for, for their case to make its way through the courts. Um, so that's the first development that we've seen in post-Cold War period. The second um, uh, development is uh, concerns over national security. Since the World Trade Center bombings of 1993 and, and certainly 9-11, there's a, a growing association of, of immigration with national security, a growing concern that uh, would-be terrorists, uh, people that wish to cause us harm, are using the immigration bureaucracy, and particularly the asylum bureaucracy, to enter the United States and, and cause the United States harm. So there's this conflation of immigration with national security issues. And the third uh, point uh, is the growing number of people who are fleeing refugee-like conditions. They're not necessarily, uh, they can't prove uh, that they are refugees according to the 1980 Refugee Act, but they are fleeing refugee-like conditions are in need of some type of protection. And so these are the three developments that we're seeing in the post-Cold War period, and hopefully we'll have a chance to discuss them in greater depth during the q and Thank you. So thank you, Matt, Tom, and New York for putting this together. Thanks all of you. Just three hours out, don't forget. Um, so I minored, I minored in education in undergrad, and I, the only thing I remember from my education classes is that people don't hear some, don't get something until they hear it 27 times. <laughs> so for 15 seconds, let me review what uh, Maria Cristina said. So we have the war, World War II, leaving people homeless and hungry and fleeing. And as a result of that, the UN or, or uh, a special agency, the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, invites governments to sign this treaty called the, 19, uh, the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees, which gives us the definition of a refugee. You're outside of your country of origin, you're afraid, the fear is well-founded of something called being persecuted. 
because of race, religion, nationality, social group, political opinion. So the war, the convention, the U.S. doesn't sign the convention for a number of reasons. And then in 1967, the U.S. signs this amendment, which is called the Protocol, which is basically the same thing. Don't want to get into too much detail. And then in 69, the countries in Africa, in the, under this thing which no longer exists, the Organization of African Unity, they sign a baby refugee treaty where they expand the definition of a refugee. And they said, if you are here, and if we sign this, we'll give you refuge if you, if you have fled external aggression or events seriously disturbing the public order, which is like a hurricane. And then in 1984 in Colombia, the Latinos sign, copy and paste the African language and they say, we too will give you um, refuge if you've fled human rights violations or events seriously disturbing the public order. And in 1980, we, our Congress, signs this thing called the 1980 Refugee Act, which is a cut and paste of the UN definition. So that's that. So now let me focus in on the US. So our refugee law, you could argue, is part of immigration law, which is part of civil law, which is part of our law. The other way to look at refugee law is really refugee law is part of public in, uh, is part of human rights law, which is part of, of um, public international law. Either way you cut and slice the pie, we're going to talk today about refugee law. But you could argue refugee law is part of Americans of our American system, which is what we're going to, Judy especially is going to focus on. Or we could say that refugee law is part of the international system. It's the same thing. So let me focus now on some of the issues with our refugee law. I'll talk about the issues. And then I'll talk about um, some resolutions and I'll turn it over to Judy to see how they play out as it applies to real people. So first of all, let's clean up our language. A uh, refugee is someone outside trying to get in. So if you're Ethiopian and you flee to Kenya and you go to the, America, the US booth or the Australian booth or the New Zealand booth to tell your story and you win your story, you prove well-founded fear of persecution, you will be brought in <coughs> to Philadelphia International Airport, and you are coming in with the designation refugee. That changed the scenario. You are Ethiopian, and don't ask me how, you bought a Delta airline ticket, and you came to the US as a visitor. And now you have to go back in three months. If you don't want, if you're already physically here and you want to stay here, you're applying for asylum. And if you win, if you prove I'm outside of my country of origin, I'm here in Philly, not in Ethiopia, well found in fear, et cetera, and you win, your name is, you are an asylee. But the standard is the same. You have to prove well-founded fear of persecution. So if you're in trying to come in or you're here trying to stay here. So refugee, as I be, but in the streets, we use the words interchangeably. You might meet someone and you say, what are you here? They say, I'm a refugee. Actually, no, they're an asylee, but no matter. But it's a legal, technical distinction. So here are some issues facing us today. By the way, rewinding your tapes to fifth grade civics, three branches of government, legislative, executive, judicial. So Congress passes the 1980 Refugee Act. Obama executes through these regulations, and there's 42 regulations as like how to apply for asylum, and then the courts interpret the statute and the, and the regs. So here are some issues that we're facing today, and again, uh, Judy will flesh them out as it applies to real people. One is, oops, too small, but you can see. One is, um, as Maria Cristina alluded to, there are people outside trying to come in, and, and the rest of my PowerPoints will deal with people here trying to stay here. But if you are a Russian babushka, you go from the Soviet Union to Italy, and you're trying to, and then you're trying to come in from Italy to the U.S. as a refugee. There's now a presumption that because of uh, the World Trade Center incident, that you might be a terrorist. So there was, and there still is a backlog of people out there trying to come in, because we're vetting them to make sure that they're not going to come in and cook bombs. So that's an issue. Um, another issue is if you want to apply for asylum, you are Colombian and you arrive in Philly and you say don't send me back because of race, religion, nationality, etc. You have to apply within one year of setting foot in the US, otherwise you're barred. There's some exceptions. By the way, if you think that one year is really onerous, don't complain because my students and I, last March for spring break, we didn't go to Fort Lauderdale. We went to Ecuador, and we were working with a non-governmental or non organization that was working with um, Colombians seeking asylum in Ecuador. And in Ecuador, um, if you want to apply for asylum in Ecuador as a Colombian, as a Nigerian, whatever, you have to apply within 14 days of setting foot in the country. And then you have to make the line and the Ministry of State to be there in the morning and 
say I'm here and here's proof that I've been here for 13 days. Otherwise, you are barred from asking for asylum in Colombia. So 14 versus one year, one year doesn't sound so bad, but immigration advocates are saying, you know, that's crazy. So that's another issue. Issue number three is you get no lawyer paid for by government expense. So in our American system of justice, if you are charged with a crime where the punishment is a year or more in jail, which is called a felony, you are assigned a public defender if you can't afford a lawyer. In our civil legal system, that doesn't exist. If you want a divorce, pay for one. If you want to sue the M, if you want to sue someone who ran over your foot, pay for one. If you want to apply for asylum or you want some immigration benefits, pay for one. So New York City is the only municipality that to date has set up a system to, uh, to um, give uh, a lawyer to asylum seekers and some other immigration benefits. Issue number three, if you arrive at the airport without a paper, without a document, which is a without passports or your passport expired, or you flush it down the toilet in the airplane because it was a false passport, the minute you arrive at JFK International Airport, you will be put in jail. The closest jail is York County Prison, Berks County Prison, Carbon County Prisons. And issues there uh, in your county, and my, my refugee law class is going to prison um, uh, towards the end of March to interview asylum seekers in jail. And as Judy will talk a little bit maybe, we also have a prison for families. Thank God we don't separate them. So there is a family facility where we, uh, or shelter, where we detain uh, in whole families. Another issue is, in is the definition of a refugee is a refugee is a person with a well-founded fear of persecution based on race, religion, nationality, social group, political opinion. The big fat category is what does it mean to be a member of a social group? If you're a taxi cab driver, is that a member of a social group? If you're a poet, is that a member of a social group? If you're a woman, does that fit under social group? If you're a lesbian from Russia, is lesbianism part of social group? We know what's going on in Russia and the legislation that Russia passed regarding gay people. So this is the time to apply for asylum. If you are from Russia, just say the magic words. I have a well-founded fear of persecution. That's my social group. I'm gay. Russia hates me. Don't send me back. I'll be killed. Give me protection. And the last issue is uh, a little bit dealing with um, gay folks is sponsoring your, your spouse. So if you are, uh, Judy comes as a refugee, um, sh she can sponsor her husband. Can she sponsor her same-sex spouse from Russia? Uh, up in the air. So, as to the issues, exclusion, um, there are now bills in Congress, and I always hesitate to, take, to talk about bills, because what I say today on Friday might change on Monday. May he might change his mind, or, you know, the amendments might come and go, but these, but these are some of the quick um, possible resolutions. So, um, if, if the issue is, let's exclude people because they might be terrorists, let's not be so onerous. And um, let's be clear as to what it, who is and who is not a terrorist so that we can allow people to come in. If the issue is you have to apply within a year to get asylum, don't use a year. Use two years. Or before the, the law passed, there was no limit on when you could apply for asylum. If the issue is you want a lawyer to represent you, go to HIAS, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, or pay for your own damn lawyer. The issue is let's apply the criminal system way of thinking to asylum applicants because it's really important. Just like if you're found guilty, you might end up going to jail for a year or more. If you're found not eligible for asylum, you will be sent back to Haiti, Somalia, Sudan, where you might be persecuted. If the issue is let's detain you for lack of paper, no paper, or expired paper, let's, get, let's come up with alternatives to detention. Um, and there's been many proposals put out on how about a, an electronic ankle bracelet? How about posting bonds? How about bunches of other things which we could get into Q&A? If the issue is what exactly does it mean to be a member of a social group and the third branch of government has developed case law on can a woman be a member of a social group? Like don't send me back to India because if you send me back I'll be burned because my, I'm a widow or I'm a poet who wrote against the communist regime or I'm a gay person from Uganda or um, Russia. So social group, we're, we are moving towards a tighter definition, but basically um, the resolution is um, clarify, and we are clarifying, more and more case lies out there.
uh, expanding and clarifying the definition of what it means to be a member of a social group. And finally, this is really esoteric, maybe nobody here cares about this, but just as in the non-asylum world, but in the regular immigration world, if a, if a US citizen can sponsor his wife to join him from England, so should a US citizen, same uh, male, be able to sponsor his spouse from Egypt. And similarly, that applies to refugees. If you win refuge or if you win asylum, you should be able to bring over your same-sex spouse. So those are some of the issues that are percolating in this business that we're in as to you know, refugees and, and asylum. Hi everyone. Well, I'm, I'm really honored to be here. I want to thank um, Tom and everybody who organizes and I'm especially happy to be representing the front lines, so to speak. Uh, my organization, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society of Pennsylvania, we've been around 132 years and we're also part of a national network of nine to ten national organizations that work with the Department of State to resettle refugees. The process by which a refugee gets from a camp or from uh, that place in Ethiopia to Philadelphia is beyond the, the scope of what I can deal with right now, but I'd be happy to talk about it if you have time in the question period. We resettle about 161 refugees last year of many countries around the world, including ethnic minorities from Burma, Myanmar, uh, ethnic Nepalese from Bhutan, Iraqis, Eritreans, Darfuris, and religious minorities from the former Soviet Union. So you get a sense of who's getting refugee status. And lately, under refugee law, um, the idea of someone being warehoused in camps and cannot return to their home country are given priority for resettlement. That's why we're doing the Burmese who've been in camps in Thailand for 20 years, and the Nepalese, ethnic Nepalese in Idelic Bhutan, which is idyllic for everybody but the Nepalese, who have been living in camps in Nepal, who have priorities for resettlement because they couldn't go back to their country of origin. Um, here are some statistics to put a little flesh on uh, the refugee and asylum situation. So in 1980, we, we about 207,000 refugees were admitted to the United States. And at that time, before the Refugee Act was passed, less than 4,000 people applied for asylum. Immediately after the Act passed, the following year, about 26,000 people applied for asylum. Um, at the same time, refugee admissions seemed to be going down. Uh, until it hit a low in 2002, right after 2001, when we let in about 26,000 refugees. As you can see in that in this slide, the number of asylees has remained somewhat stable even after 9/11, and now has uh, turned upwards. Um, I have a few different statistics. Uh, those uh, claiming asylum affirmatively, which is a, a different from people in detention, last year uh, was about 78,000 people. But when you combine it with people in detention and other people who are picked up and then claim asylum, it does approach 100,000. Uh, but still, when we add the refugees and asylees together, they're less than our previous history of refugee admissions. So that's just something to keep in mind. And uh, next, oh, me. Okay, <laughs> top nationalities of refugees has changed significantly. Um, so in 1990, the purple are Europeans, and we're talking mostly of people from the former Soviet Union, again, a response to the Cold War. And the, the um, blue is Asian, South East Asian, where we're talking about the Indo-Chinese resettlement. And as you head over to 2008, you see that the European number is very small. And the Asian number is still big, but not because of the Vietnamese, because of the Burmese and the Nepalese and others. And the growing number is the Iraqis and the Africans. So refugee admissions depends on geopolitical things and politics, those two things. Also, um, the line on the bottom represents Central and South Americans, and it's almost entirely Cuban. Uh, you know, I always look at these immigration charts and I never see Pennsylvania on it because we're such a small state. But we are on the refugees chart because we're one of the top ten 
refugee receiving states in uh, in the country, and we we vary from being the fifth largest to the eighth largest. But the numbers are not huge. We're talking two to three thousand people. The number of immigrants who come, documented, would be ten times as much. Documented, undocumented, twenty times as much. But it's still significant that we are a refugee receiving state. Here are the top countries of people who were already in the United States and asked for asylum. Again, you might want to see some politics behind this. Because if you look at 1990, the people who were applying for asylum in droves were the Central Americans. You had 20, 30, even 40,000 people from El Salvador that year applying for asylum. They're not the top people granting asylum. Same is true for the Guatemalans. Same is true for the Hondurans. But the people who were granted were the Nicaraguans. Again, reflection of the Cold War uh, politics in the time. In 1997, um, these were the top countries, and China seems to be a constant. And of course, again, it reflects the political realities, because in 2012, for the first time we had Egypt, and now we have Venezuela. That doesn't mean people who've applied. It means people who have been granted asylum. Okay. Again, many people apply, but they're not granted, including a huge number of Mexicans who are applying for asylum. Okay. Fernando talked about the one-year deadline. Um, you know, for us in practice, this is a very uh, interesting issue because the most traumatized people are often the people who wait the longest because they're so terrified they're not going to win their case. And so they're almost in a state of denial or in a state of not wanting to relive the experience. So ironically, the one-year deadline really, in many ways, harms the most vulnerable people. So that's a very big issue for us. And we often have to use psychological uh, therapists or other people to interview somebody to explain why they waited for so long. And we're very successful with the right evaluator um, to show that they had an exception to the one new deadline. Another issue that was very uh, uh, harmful to asylum seekers, in my view, is anybody applying for asylum can't get work authorization. They can't even apply for 150 days. And what this meant is we've got asylum, people seeking asylum, living in homeless shelters. Uh, they may be released from a family shelter in Berks, but they're released into homelessness if nobody will take them in. Um, and organizations like ours that provide low cost or free legal services are in very high demand for these cases and we have very limited capacity uh, to represent, although we certainly try. And this has been a really big problem of lack of employment authorization uh, for people seeking asylum. Um, another uh, Thing that uh, is a social group which is in so much litigation about, again, no clarity, and I wanted to talk about that. Um, we believe that in, in, uh, in the immigration advocate circle, the matter of Acosta uh, had the best definition of social group, which is an immutable characteristic or a common trait, innate, such as sex, color, or kinship ties, or shared past experiences. Fundamental characteristics that cannot or should not be required to change. Uh, the law has added to the Board of Immigration Appeals this requirement that nobody understands social visibility. It doesn't make sense if you're gay, for example, maybe you want to be invisible. Why would you want to be visible? If you're visible, you're beaten up and killed. So how do you transport that new requirement onto people who claim persecution based on social group. The other one is particularity. Well, what does that mean? Um, uh, we claim in certain circumstances maybe women should be a social group if they're in a country that represses women. That that could be a social group. They have an immutable characteristic, women. And if the government cannot or will not protect them. So this is the debate going on in immigration law today. Um, where the social group's been found, family and clan membership, victims of gender violence, this is an emerging area, uh, where uh, sexual orientation, um, an, um, another emerging area, I already said this, family and clan membership, still emerging, sexual orientation, it's really emerged, 
but the level of individualized persecution you have to show is very high. Uh, threatened by gangs or former gang members, uh, we actually have a case now in the Third Circuit, uh, well it's back before the board that's being watched internationally, about a young man that everybody agrees is he would be killed if he went back to Honduras. The question is, is he part of a social group of young men who refuse to join gangs? And the law in this area is very unsettled, uh, although it's beginning to move in favor of protection. Uh, and finally, gender asylum. Uh, I did want to say another thing. We talked about the family shelter, which of course I visited, where whole families are detained in Brooks County, the only one in the country I would And it is constantly full, because it is the only one in the whole, whole country. So people come there for a month, and then they're sent to family members, or they're sent to another shelter. It's a, it's a it's, it's pretty um, compelling place. But what we have now, and this is related to uh, the fact that, in my opinion, the Central American refugee crisis has taken on new characteristic in terms of youth. So what we're seeing now is youth from Honduras and Guatemala, more than from Mexico, and uh, the countries of Central America where the governments have not been able to protect them from gangs and they have no future coming to the United States in astounding numbers. So we have an immigrant youth advocacy project. When we started our project, maybe 6,000 youth would cross the border. This is without adults. They're crossing by themselves. They're between age 8 and 17. That's how I define them. Last two years ago, there were 24,000 across the border, and almost all of them are caught, by the way, because we have really good border enforcement, contrary to what we hear from other people around our, our borders. And this year, we may see 50,000 youth crossing the border. And this is another area where the law has enlarged for the protection of those youth. They can be placed on a path if they're unaccompanied, and they've been abused or neglected, they can get a status called Special Immigrant Juvenile. So they're not refugees in the traditional sense, but they are in the sense that the upheavals of the Central American Wars are still being felt today. And there were so many people who tried to seek asylum in the United States from Central America who were denied. And to me, this is the this is the, just a continuation of that process. So I'll just end there. Um, as the, 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 the last thing I want to say is that certainly different demographics between the refugees who come here now, many of whom are from Africa or South Asia, and people who come here as immigrants, many of whom come here from Latin America. So we're dealing with different demographics. But sometimes there's a lot of gray area between who's a refugee, like in the case of these young uh, unaccompanied minors, and needs protection, and who's an immigrant. So uh, in that sense, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting time in immigration and refugee law. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to open the floor to, for discussion since uh, you know, I'm, I'm the moderator in case I get, I get the chance to ask the first question here. So uh, I know that you, you touch on issues of immigration law and, and, uh, and I know that you're making comments because nobody really knows exactly where the whole thing is going. But you know, we're all talking about reforming the immigration system and I wanted to, to, to get your feelings about uh, what's the, 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 the position of of refugee law in these broader discussions about immigration. Are we talking about it? Should we talk more about it? Uh, why should we talk more about it? Which groups uh, could push for having a broader discussion about refugees and asylum seekers and um, and related, you know, this is sort of a, like a, a, on a, a different topic. But I wanted to, to see if you can, uh, I, I wonder about uh, how people become asylum seekers, and uh, they, they, you know, you're talking about that that first year. It seems that it seems there are two refugees. You know, the government decides that group is 
as a refugee, an asylum seeker is somebody that here becomes an asylum seeker. And I, I wonder about how well can we categorize people. You know, in immigration law, there's always attempts to, you know, categories of migrants. But then in the in the real world, you know, it's very difficult to specify categories of, of migrants. And so, uh, how does the process happen? You know, what happened in that year? I had a chance to to testify in an asylum case in Philadelphia. And it was, uh, you know, just very briefly, it was a, it was a woman that my uh, undocumented worker came to the U.S. and then there was a raid, so she was apprehended, and then she applied for asylum. And so, how can you distinguish if was she an economic migrant and uh, uh, she was for domestic violence? And she clearly had a case. It was she an economic migrant, a, a domestic violent migrant, and uh, the notion of the social group is something that you know it seems very interesting. And uh, and it, you know, I was I. I the tension was that, on the one hand, she was she suffered domestic violence, but had to be presented as a group. So if it's women, then it becomes very broad. And then, and so, can you comment a little, a little bit more about those those tensions? I, I can tackle the first part of the question. Um, my my understanding, I feel that that the discussion of refugee uh, reform or, or la uh, legal reform is very separate from the larger discussion about immigration reform. I think the two have become bifurcated. Um, with regard, um, I think there is a recognition that we do need to revamp our refugee and asylum bureaucracy. That that there are uh, too many problems and uh, and that we're not really serving this population. And so, uh, Patrick Leahy, back in 2010, introduced a bill. Um, called the Refugee Protection Act, and it never made uh, made it out of the Senate Judiciary Committee. He reintroduced it in 2011 and in 2013, and as of last month, GovTrack, which you know follows the, the life of these bills, gave the uh, the bill a seven percent chance of becoming law. So, uh, so just like the larger discussion about immigration reform, it's it's stagnant. You know, it, and, um, but the two have always historically been separated. Um, and, and perhaps it is time to, to bring the two together, but at present it seems to be following these very two different tracks. Now, you, you had a second part of, of your yes. question. Do you want to tackle that? But, um, so you heard the, the back of the from the, you had many questions. <laughs> but, um, so you heard the president talk on whenever he talks. And he's talked about immigration reform. He gave it like two paragraphs, but then he didn't go into the subset of immigration. So refugees are a folder within the fi a file within the folder of immigration. And so no, he didn't say you know the one year deadline has to end. So it's a, it's such a esoteric thing unless we're in it. Um, on the the other issue is like how do you determine the, the case that you testified for? What is the process? How does how does the government determine whether you're a refugee or not? Well, um, for those of you who work at nonprofits and you might be applying for funding, um, the giving you of a grant or not, maybe to put this panel together, the grant maker, it's all, it's, it's an art, it's not a science. We as teachers, when we write papers, we like to think that we're being objective, we're really being very subjective. The grading of papers, of essays, is, uh, is an art, not a science. The granting or denying and the listening to a story of an asylum applicant is an art, not a science. The fancy word we have in the UN is it's refugee status determination. So maybe you're telling, my is telling me her story today, I'm having a bad hair day, she's not telling her story very clear. It's many factors going to the granting or denying of asylum in a refugee status determination. Maybe the applicant had a bad lawyer, maybe the listener, the trier of fact, was a fall asleep at the wheel, maybe the lawyer didn't prep the applicant. So many factors go into whether someone went or not, and as Judy pointed out, in an amorphous category like social group, you have to meet all the problems of the definition, fear, it's well-founded, what is persecution, being hung upside down, being tortured, being put in jail for a day, three days, five days, being whipped, being evidence, how you look, credibility, and for Asian applicants, who show respect by looking at the floor for an American interviewer. If you're looking at the floor, that means you're a shifty-eyed liar. So the lawyer has, so there's a lot of factors that go into determining whether someone wins or not. So that is sort of you know, the process. It's not scientific. If it were, you could just type in some words to the computer, hung upside down, whipped, closed, and then the computer would say, yes, this is a refugee, give her asylum. But it's not a science, it's an, it's an art of interviewing and of prepping the client. I would say a few, add a few things. One is, 
um, under asylum law, a lot of people come with nothing. They have no papers. I, I represented someone from Eritrea who had fled Eritrea and he went to South Africa and he got on a freighter and he went to Mexico and he landed in the United States and then he was detained. He had no papers. He came from a village where the so-called city hall burned down. There was no evidence that he was Eritrean, that he was who he said he was, etc. Fortunately, he had some relatives here who could give de um, affidavits, and here was my direct, direct examination of him. Well, where are you from? What language do you speak? He spoke to Grinia, which is the language of Eritrean. Um, uh, do you know the history of Eritrea? Oh, yes, he did. Uh, do you have an actual anthem? Oh, yes. Can you sing it? Yes, and he's, all right, the judge says, there's no reason to sing the national anthem. Well, who would know their national anthem? unless you were from that country. This is what you have to do sometimes in some of these asylum cases. Now, in the bigger issue, I want to make three points. One is, as an immigrant advocate that sees the economic migrants as well as the asylum seekers, we do not, what we have to avoid is the good immigrant versus the bad. The good immigrant being, you know, the torture upside down, burned, whipped, the bad immigrant, people coming because they're economically oppressed or because they're coming to work. That's a danger and we've worked really hard in the immigrant advocacy community to not have that dichotomy. Second, in the Senate Bill 744, which is the big Senate bill that was passed, there are a few elements for protection of asylum seekers and actually I'm proud to say my national organization, HIAS, that's their portfolio. Their job is to infuse refugee resettlement issues and refugee advocacy into any comprehensive immigration advocacy. So nationally we have agreements among ourselves of which organizations are taking on which issues. Uh, finally, um, it is possible to get asylum if you're very economically oppressed if it's for one of the other reasons. In other words, if you were in the wrong political party and nobody would ever give you a job and they wouldn't let your kids go to school and you couldn't survive, you're an economic migrant, clearly because you have no job, but you're a political, it's because of your political opinion. So we have to hook the economic oppression to one of the other grounds. Uh, but it's clear in the law of asylum that merely being an impoverished, really poor person is not going to be grounds for asylum. So that, that we cannot do. But what we often find is another book. And so being in a country, and this is, we haven't quite done this, but being in a, a woman in a country that doesn't protect you because of domestic violence, that now becomes a claim. Or where you can't work in addition, because, so you can't leave the abusive situation, then you start building a case from there. But there's definitely a, a, a bright, it's not a bright line, but there's certainly a line. And, um, you know, on the other hand, we have cases where somebody's very economically successful, but they're going to be killed because they're the wrong religion. They're very hard cases. Well, how can you say you're an asylum seeker when you worked at the university for three years? Well, yes, I work, but if I work four years, I'll be killed because I've outspoken, they've arrested me. So these are the kind of discussions you, you have in an asylum and case. If I might add to that, it, it's, it's so important to have somebody advocating for you, to have legal representation, to have somebody like Judy or like Fernando walking you through your case, assisting you. If you have legal representation, your chances of securing asylum improve by 60 percent. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I know we've all read about uh, cases of, of individuals that you read about in the newspaper and you think, now how did that person secure asylum? For example, there's a very controversial case right now of a family from Germany that wished to homeschool their children because it's, um, it, it's, it's illegal to do so in their home country. And at the first level, when they first petitioned for asylum, they secured asylum, or, or they received a favorable verdict, and it's because they had a very um, powerful organization, a Christian evangelical organization, with a considerable amount of, of money to pay for their lawyers, 
who gave them wonderful representation, and at the first level, they secured a very uh, a favorable verdict. Now, uh, the government has won on appeal, but now they're threatening to take their case all the way to the Supreme Court if the Supreme Court will listen to it. But the reason they're able to do this is because they have a lot of money backing them, right? And they're able to, to take it through to the very end. Most asylum seekers do not have a legal representation. They don't, they're not fortunate enough to have somebody like my colleagues here represent, representing their cases. Yeah, several years ago, a colleague at Harvard, Debbie Anker, came up with a study, which was done by her students, of course, um, which showed that if you have representation, you win, uh, or have a higher perspective. Back to the religion. So if you represent yourself, or you have no access to a lawyer, and you say, don't send me back to Iran because I can't work, then you'll be seen as an economic migrant down. If you somehow get on and you and you say, don't send me back to Iran because I can't work, because I am a Baha'i. So it's I have a well found fear of persecution based on my religion, I am Baha'i. And I can't work and I can't go to school. So legal representation, all they will know how to dot the I's and cross the T's. So it, it has to be linked. The, the otherwise you'll be seen as an economic economic migrant and now in the area of immigration law, not in the area of refugee law. And, but I will say that we use a lot of um, experts, and if any of you are experts in your field, we need you to be pro bono experts. I've used people from the University of Penn before in some cases to talk about general country conditions, because in asylum law you have to prove a subjective fear, but you also have to prove your subjective fears based on objective conditions. And so we need country conditions experts to show the objective situation in the country and that's often very important because the client is not going to be able to say that or if the client does say that it's looked on it's looked down upon because what's your authority to say that and uh, and so we, we do need um, academics and psychologists yes. it's an interdisciplinary um, uh, exercise asylum Yes, if anyone here is from psychology or psychiatry, talk to us because we belong to an immigration professor's list, uh, immigration professor's list. And an email came out from Pennsylvania Immigrant Resource Center out of York County. And the poor, overworked um, attorney says, does anyone know of any mental health expert? I need someone to testify that this person has a well-founded fear. So if you are a psychologist or a psychiatrist, you could do an assessment for free, for work and say, yes, this person shows signs of uh, post-traumatic stress, she can't sleep, and it's associated with the persecution that she suffered in Sri Lanka or whatever. So it's, we need Africa Studies people, Latin America Studies people, psychologists, psychiatrists, all to help one case. Um, I had a question, and, and I should second that because I've done lots of these cases. Um, and for Hyas, and then for a while I was on Steve Morley's Roto Dial, I think, well, during the Columbia cases. But, and it was a very bizarre experience. Um, just my favorite moment ever was being asked by a judge to define politics for the court, which I couldn't do with a straight face because academics, what politics means, historians, please. Right? So you have a lot, you have a lot of fun. I'm really interested in the way that the advocacy community, community interfaces with, um, your congressional aid types and your, uh, your capital types and your, and your lady types because on the face of it, it is so striking when you talk to people in the immigrant advocacy kind of world, I mean, a lot of them are open borders people, a lot of them are socialists, a lot of them are people who, when they're speaking very frankly about who they are and what their political vision is, um, over a long term, let's just say, um, it's, it's really hard to understand how they're able, in some cases effectively, many times not effectively, how they're able to have a voice um, in the capital health system. And I'm just really curious about that and about what your experience of that has been. I certainly think there are different, um, I do think the good and bad refuge uh, immigrant is definitely plays out on, mm -hmm. um, on the Hill. So you will find people who will support refugee stuff because they come in legally. But the, the idea of legal versus not legal is very strong. So you'd have this guy who, um, who was the representative from Kansas, a pretty conservative person, but he was very much in favor of refugees. So sometimes you work with people on that issue. 
as opposed to um, general immigration without necessarily alienating or uh, using the good-bad immigrant dichotomy. I guess that's one strategy. Um, and I'm not sure that all immigrant advocates, they run the gamut. There's certainly people in the group that are open borders people and socialists, maybe, I don't know. But there's certainly people who are not. And uh, we, we take, at highest, we do a lot of interfaith work. That's how we, that's our niche in the, in the equation. And we take great pains to be as inclusive as possible. So, and to include mainstream, upright people when we go visit our Congress people. Uh, you know, it's a funny thing, you go and visit a, a, a Congress office, and you have to be really strategic about it. So if I have two congregations who I'm working with, and one has 800 members and one has 30, even though the one 30 may be closer to me politically, um, I'm going to go with the 800 <laughs> person. Right. So it's, you know, you learn how to, you learn what counts. And um, finally, highest, and we do a tremendous amount of citizenship. We've done 5,000 applications for those who are eligible and I think working on the other end of immigration and naturalizing people and voting is really important and uh, and so that's another way we get the message across and I think it got across in the last election would you say with the Latino vote uh, that's what that what a difference an election makes you know in terms of immigration reform in terms of refugee stuff uh, you know, I think that's a different message, and I think it's it, 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 there's a blending, but I think there's a there's more of a human rights and a humanitarian message behind that. I also want to take a different spin to your question, which is um, from a management perspective. So many nonprofits focus their strategies for making the world a better place is to do direct services, one-on-one -on -one individuals. Other nonprofits don't look at people; they are systems change advocates, mm -hmm. and there are other nonprofits don't that do just pure research and they publish. And so, very few and rare is the nonprofit that is that is capable and can both do direct services and advocacy. And if advocacy, do they know how to use a five-minute FaceTime with Patrick Leahy or right, or whatever? And so this is a challenge that I've seen. So you could be a great direct service advocate, but you're a horrible speaker because you go all over, but not Judy, of course, but you go all over the place and you know you don't know how to use your time. So it's not just a matter of knowing the content, but how to knock on the door, how to use your six minutes, and then get out and leave. So um, so we so I don't know if there's warden types here, but you know, we desperately need marketing. People who know marketing, who know branding, who know get to the point messaging and just shut up and get out. Um, I'm really interested in hearing more about the difference between economic migrants and migrants looking for uh, asylum from persecution. The reason I say that is looking at um, the chart that you had up, that the four biggest states which receive the most number of um, uh, refugees are the four biggest states in the Union but then the fifth state was Arizona which has you know a really sordid history when it comes to immigration and I cannot for the life of me figure out how you can have a state that's so virulently anti-immigrant yet still be for its size so pro-refugee do you guys think that you can help me with that well uh I think it has to do with legal versus undocumented on one level because refugees come in. But I will say this, the spillover is happening. So Arizona may be a state that is welcoming refugees. It's a much smaller number. I mean, it's a much smaller number. You know, look at the chart. Uh, if it was Arizona, uh, they took a certain percentage of the refugees, but we are letting in 70,000 refugees a year. So how does 70,000 compare to 200,000 people who are coming in in other ways, legally and unauthorized? So first of all, it's a numbers thing. It's, it's a legal thing. But, also but I do want to say that there's been pushback. So in Georgia and in New Hampshire, governments are beginning to pass laws 
saying we shouldn't accept refugees anymore because they're too expensive. They, unlike immigrants, by the way, are eligible for public benefits. They're, they're humanitarian. And there's now a spillover. So eventually, so, so they do work together, but they are looked on differently. And I, to me, a lot of it is the numbers and the legality. And then thirdly is maybe the humanitarian um, aspect. But the other reason I think it's changing is who are the refugees in the early 90s and late 80s? They were European, people look like me. <laughs> Russian, not Latino. They were Cubans, they were Southeast Asians uh, who uh, we owe a debt to because of the war. So these were not populations that we had necessarily a lot of negatives about, except for the Asians, I think, if I can be frank, because of race issues. But now the populations are different. They're predominantly Muslim, many African, many Easter, uh, Iraqis. Now the tide is turning, and there's more negativity about refugees. So, so let's see what Arizona does now. Uh, even though you're, it's a large refugee resettlement state, um, I think there's probably going to be uh, some pushback if lots of refugees came. You know, having said that, we could do it if we wanted. 207,000 in 1980 in the whole country. Now we're down to 70,000 last year, and that was a big year. I think, you know, it might be that the population in Arizona is sophisticated enough to be able to segment the difference between immigrant and refugee. So they might dislike the illegal Mexican, but they might, because of the churches, synagogues, or the two temples, they might want to help the vulnerable Somali or the vulnerable uh, whatever. The other thing is money. So refugees do come with money. Asylees don't come, typically. But what I see in the States, I've seen um, internationally. So why would a poor country like Kenya or a poor country like Thailand agree to take in refugees for a short term anyway and set up side that piece of real estate, that land, to set up a refugee camp? Because it brings in money. So when we set up our refugee camp for Cambodians in Thailand, we have to give Thailand money to buy the rice, latrines, bed cots, tents. Uh, Kenya, with all its problems, allows uh, people from the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, Somalia to go in because it comes with because allowing a refugee camp to set up brings international aid. It's it's all about money, and so uh, the Department of uh, Health and Human Services Office of Refugee Resettlement gives money to the Department of Public Welfare of the different states, for, so it's money. Um, but, it, but, if it, but then as Judy said, if it comes to some point, then they'll do a cost benefits analysis and it's not worth us to take all these Somalis even though they come with money. Forget it, we're not gonna take anybody anymore. But agency, you know, you might dispute this, but re, uh, resettlement agencies get some money to do this and maybe it's not enough but so HHS ORR gives money to a state refugee coordinator who then streams down the money to highest Catholics, Lutherans, etc., to receive refugees. So it's money. And so again, I'm hoping that the, um, the population is sophisticated to say there's a difference between refugees and, and those, in, those illegals. Uh, let us continue to take refugees because of my because my religion decides that we should. Maybe I suspect that in Arizona um, that faith-based communities are playing a big role in recruiting refugees and asylum seekers to the area. For example, there's the Southside Presbyterian Church in Tucson, which historically, from the from the from 1980 on, has played a very visible role in assisting refugees and asylum seekers. And so, um, you know, as I as I mentioned in my talk yesterday. Um, domestic adv advocacy groups are playing a very big role in, figure in, in determining who gets prioritized for admission uh, to the United States. And I gave some examples in yesterday's talk about um, how the role that American Jewish groups played in, in, in um, helping uh, Congress uh, to facilitate the entrance of so many refugees next from the, form from the Soviet Union and then the, the former Soviet Union. Uh, the role that the Congressional Black, Black Caucus has played in, in carving a space for Haitian asylum seekers. The, the role that Cuban American legislators have played in, in, um, in crafting the wet foot, dry foot policy that has allowed so many Cuban people to remain in the United States. So, so since the 
Cold War, and you didn't see this as much during the Cold War period, but since the end of the Cold War, we're seeing that domestic, uh, domestic advocacy groups are playing a very, very prominent role in shaping the contours of refugee and asylum policy. I did want to mention something about money. Um, the federal policy now is that every refugee who comes gets $1,100 per capita per person in the family, uh, and then um, um, they're supposed to go to work, or if they can't, they can access public welfare uh, when that money runs out. So that lasts about two months, and you can't survive on welfare. Uh, if, in case you're not aware of this, a family of three, for example, on welfare in Philadelphia gets $410 a month. So we put families in an uh, apartment where it's $450 a month or $500 if you can find it. And they could never survive just on welfare because the welfare wouldn't even cover the rent. So we are, we use a lot of donations in furnishing the house. We do anything, this is like a, this is like a Red Cross money saving operation. Uh, and uh, it is insufficient to support the refugees, and that is why um, uh, we need to have a conversation about what it means to welcome refugees. Because I feel terrible to bring refugees into a situation where they don't have time to learn English and time to get a decent job, and then we expose them to a new round of homelessness. And I think that has to be addressed in terms of our internal refugee policy. And by the way, we get $750 per refugee for our staff, that's all. So the program does not support uh, services, and we're expected to serve the refugee from three to maybe six months, and then the money stops. It is not a system that will work without other supports, and we work very closely with congregations provide us with supplemental support, but it's not enough. So I do want to mention that one of the issues is not just who gets here, but what happens when they come, and, and how, do we, how do we build that capacity. And that's very different from the Cold War. During the Cold War, there were these very generous um, accommodation programs. So the, the classic example is the Cuban Refugee uh, Program, where the federal government invested close to a billion dollars in helping the Cubans retool for life in the United States, from job retraining, uh, through uh, uh, all kinds of services, uh, language uh, uh, programs, uh, helping professionals um, uh, adapt um, or train for the credentializing exams uh, that they needed to pass in order to practice their professions in the United States. And that's one of the reasons why I think the Cubans have done comparatively well compared to other Latino groups in the United States because it really helps to have the federal government give you their stamp of approval and invest all this money in helping you retool for life in the United States. Those kinds of generous refugee accommodation programs that existed during the Cold War, they no longer exist in the post-Cold War era. It's much more limited support and um, you know, some refugee advocates would say that it's a deliberate attempt to uh, dissuade people from coming to the United States if they know that they're going to be detained, um, perhaps deported, uh, that they're going to receive very little assistance, that it's a deliberate strategy to discourage people from coming. So to that point, both uh, Maria and Fernando had on your slides that national security threat has created a backlog in refugee refugees being accepted in the U.S. How how is it different now? Um, it, it seems to me like there was just as much a perceived threat in, during the Cold War as there is now currently, and why has that changed? And is it more rhetoric, or is there actually an evidence-based threat um, that you know, terrorists are trying to use the refugee process to get into the United States? Well, I, I think that the turning point, the tipping point, was the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Um, you know, prior to 1996, say, and 93, uh, if you were an asylum se a seeker, chances are you would be released into society, told to return for your court date. And, and some people returned, some people disappeared into the underground economy, never to be heard from again. But by the mid-1990s, uh, we had already uh, so many asylum seekers because of the wars in Central America, primarily. And a lot of people were not showing up for their court dates. Uh, they were just disappearing. And so the INS began to resort increasingly towards detention. And then uh, with the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, where uh, Ramzi Yusuf came in in 1993, he asked for asylum. 
um, he, uh, they sent him to a detention facility in New Jersey. The detention facility was overcrowded at the time of his arrival. So they released him into society and told him to just return in November for his court date. But by that date, he had already uh, carried out his attack on the World Trade Center bombing, and he was back in, in Pakistan. And so consequently, as a result of the 1993 World Trade Center um, attack, Three years later, when Congress passed the Illegal Immigration and Immigrant Responsibility Act, there were several provisions to deal with these problems in the asylum bureaucracy. Um, and two of them uh, I'd like to uh, mention, uh, expedited removal and the automatic detention of, of asylum seekers. So since 1996, you are more likely to be detained, especially if you arrive and you don't have papers, and most asylum seekers don't have papers that uh, will demonstrate their identity, prove their identity. So you are more likely to be detained after 1996 than you were before 1996. And, and now um, we have this uh, thing in place called expedited removal where we give enormous authority to the gatekeeper, an, I, uh, uh, an ICE officer at a port of entry, who asks you a number of questions to establish whether you have a credible fear. <coughs> and this is something that, that Fernando was talking about earlier, and that gatekeeper, if he's having a bad day or if she's having a bad day and misinterprets your bodily cues, is more likely to say, no, you don't have a credible fear and put you back on a plane to your home country. Um, and the system as, as it exists now has very few checks and balances. The Leahy Bill would establish another credible fear hearing to, you know, to establish so that there you would receive two credible fear hearings um, to kind of prevent the, you know, these, these very uh, uh, personal evaluations from affecting a bona fide asylum seeker. Speed, are you still, uh, are you involved with IRAP? Yeah. So, um, IRAP is the Iraqi Refugee Assistance Project. It's a student-run group at Penn with headquarters in D.C. or New York. Do you want to tell them what happened? So, so this presumption of terrorism is applied as to people from the Middle East. you want to share quickly what happened in a, what's going on with applicants for refuge from Iraq in Jordan? Yeah, we have a lot of clients, some who are applying as, refu or as refugees and others who are applying under this special similar provision that's for people who cooperated with the U.S. government in Iraq and are now threatened because of that. Even those people have been, their security file, security checks have taken like a year and a half, even if they get to the stage where their refugee application is approved, or they're approved under that separate legislation for Iraqis. They, um, there, some people, it's just, we don't hear from the Department of State for like a really long time, and then a bunch of them have been denied. And there's no, I mean, I think it's hard in general to appeal refugee designations, but there's no way to challenge the security unless you can find some connection you have in like the embassy in Baghdad or something. I, we haven't found a way to help people in that situation. Right. Um, a lot of times these refugee determinations or a council of officials where there's no legal appeal. That's why people come here from Mexico and other places because if they apply here, at least uh, they can avail themselves of the American legal system where there is the possibility of appeal if you can get through the airport. Um, I, I think national security is very different now than it was during the Cold War. I think in the Cold War, our fear was of communism and of totalitarianism that took a different shape. It was the state. And we viewed the people fleeing from those states as our friends because they were against a totalitarian state issue. Now I think the issue of national security is around terrorism, includes non-state actors that we perceive to be threats. And so I think, and I think it's also, there's an element of, um, if, I, if I may say so, you know, fear of Muslims, fear of fundamentalism, and some of it, some of, you know, and of course there was some instance where some people did us harm. So it's a very different national security issue uh, that we're looking at now and we're looking at in the initial <coughs> Before we end, I want to say if anybody um, speaks Arabic, uh, talk to speak up to me because for spring break, uh, students are going to Iraq to interview Syrian women from the front, the front pan. 
Syrian women going into a rock seeking refuge, and we definitely need um, Arabic speaking people. And if you speak Spanish, uh, another group of students, the International Human Rights Advocates at the law school, is going to Costa Rica to interview Nicaraguans who are migrant workers. So if you speak Spanish, you're interested to see me because come with us too. Um, and if you have $12, which is like a dollar a, uh, a month, make a tax deductible donation to Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society because as you heard. I have brochures. Yes. <laughs> PayPal or a check. Uh, brochures. Uh, well, my uh, uh, question relates to the uh, Cold War uh, discussion, and you may have answered this in your lecture yesterday, which I couldn't attend, but um, uh, I'm a political scientist, and it was the conventional wisdom of political science during the Cold War that the who is a refugee question was answered primarily in terms of American foreign policy interests. Uh, if you were being persecuted by a communist, you were a refugee. If you were being persecuted by a dictator who was a friend of ours, you were not a refugee. Right. And so I'm wondering how this has changed in the uh, uh, post-Cold War uh, world. Uh, how much are the um, answers of who's a refugee being driven by the advocacy of domestic groups, as you indicated? How much are they being driven by uh, international definitions or multilateral alliances in which we're involved? Uh, 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 how much are they driven by uh, the general public opinion of you know uh, who we like and who we're scared of? Uh, what are the drivers of who is a refugee today? I, I think you've just about answered the question. Actually, uh, I think during during the Cold War, you're absolutely right. It was mostly the executive branch, and for the first decade in the post Cold War period, say from 1990 to 2000, the the specter of the Cold War still seemed to hover in the background because 90 percent of our admissions came from the former Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc, from Cuba and from Southeast Asia. Since then, we see the uh, responsibilities um, for this policy distributed more equally uh, among the different branches. I mean, you still have the executive branch that is uh, working with the, the UNHCR, uh, the State Department is working with the UNHCR, with the IOM to decide who's going to be brought in as a refugee. But then you have the judicial branch deciding who is going to receive asylum and we're receiving more and more asylum seekers and that those numbers are being applied to the overall refugee quota. And then you have uh, domestic advocacy groups trying to influence the Congress and Congress uh, passing these occasional acts that will facilitate the entrance of particular groups that are deemed in the national interest. So you see it more evenly distributed among the different branches of, of uh, of By the way, none of us talked about, so Africa has expanded the definition of a refugee um, with a simple declaration, the Latin American countries have expanded, and we do have an expanded definition of a refugee, which we forgot to talk about, and you can definitely see politics at work. So our definition of a refugee, which is found in section 1, 1, 8, 42, of the acts as a refugee, blah, blah, blah. Then there's another section that says, and if you come from a country where you, where you have to undergo forced sterilization, yes. Um, we, you can also claim, ref, this is the, this is yeah. legislation, this yeah. is not regulation or case by judicial decisions. So guess who, guess who Bush, who's pro-family and Southern Baptist, guess who they were trying, who they were like almost obviously saying, and if you come from this country, which we don't like because they, they, they do abortions, come on in and you can apply for asylum. So isn't that interesting in no other, no other country in the world has added this so obviously political definition. But to your question though, so we have tried to become more neutral, so we do know that, for example, Chileans fleeing from right-wing Chile have gotten um, asylum here. Um, so whether, so in theory, and sometimes in practice, whether you come from a left-wing or a right-wing regime, if you can prove well-founded fear of persecution based on one, two, three, four, five, you should get asylum, but definitely politics. Why would, you're not gonna get asylum to someone from France there are friends who are, you know. I got from Spain. But anyway, that was another story. Uh, it was Gypsy. 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 Several Roma. 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 So, um, we used to have a, a rule at, at, in my office called follow the oil. And if it was an oil producing country, it was harder to get asylum. So it's a very different politics. Um, and, and this was one of our biggest uh, stresses with the Indonesian asylum seekers, many of whom were ethnic Chinese Christians and treated as minorities 
our country and we had a whole a few thousand Indonesians who came here. They managed to get visas because they were fairly wealthy, but they were terrified about going back to Indonesia. So it was a religious claim as well as an ethnic claim. And many, many lost their cases. And part of it was very political on, we want to befriend moderate Muslim countries, the State Department. And to the extent Indonesia was viewed as a moderate Muslim country, we're going to downplay certain human rights violations. So it's a lot more subtle now. But again, that's where you bring in an expert by saying, well, you know, the State Department report is, is, is it says a certain thing, but it doesn't really scratch the surface. And you have to bring in an academic person or an expert to kind of uh, reveal what's really going on in, in the country. So it's more subtle. Uh, it, and, but it's also better, and it's more equal, and it's less, for the asylum seeker on one level it's less politicized, for the refugees coming in, it's very difficult if you're from Iraq or any country um, that we are nervous about. And so, so the fault line is very different, it's not communism versus capitalism, it's, a lot of it is if you're from a Muslim country versus a non-Muslim I think we have time for one more question, if there is another. Just one, two. Oh. Oh, I was just going to ask, um, once the refugee groups have been, it's decided they'll be accepted, what's the process for who gets resettled where, and in what place and why, and then what organization kind of takes charge? There's yeah. a cow trade. <laughs> horse trade. <laughs> well, I think there's nine or ten national organizations. Highest is one of them. We used to be the biggest. Now we're one of the smallest. When the Soviets were coming, we were the biggest. And they meet every month with the State Department. The State Department says, well, I work with the United Nations, and uh, the camp in my lie in Burma has 100,000 ethnic minorities from Burma. They can't get integrated in Thailand. We want to resettle 100,000. Um, people. It meets with Australia, how many have you taken? Uh, they'll take 2,000. All right, Canada, how many? We'll take 20. U.S., how many you take? 50. Okay, so then they meet with all the, we've got 50,000 people from this camp to resettle. They meet with the 10 groups. Okay, Catholics, it's very religious faith-based. Mm -hmm. Catholics, how many? That's the biggest one. How many are you taking? Oh, well, out of the 50, we have affiliates in 150 cities, so we think we can handle, you know, 30,000. And, and out of the 30,000, 800 will go to Scranton because they have an organization in Scranton. Then they work with their affiliates. Mm -hmm. And HIAS will say, okay, well, we have, we'll take 2,000 out of the 50. And then they'll send us a, a name of somebody who um, uh, does not know right away they're going to Philadelphia and will accept them or not. They meet with the refugees in the camps, usually, or in a situation, and they ask, which country do you want to go to? And some of them said, well, I don't know which country is available. So they'll, say, <laughs> they'll say, all right, my first choice is U.S., second choice, Australia, third choice, Canada, let's just say, fourth, Germany. Uh, so they'll go and they'll say, well, the U.S. is filled. Do you want to go to Australia? Yeah, okay, so you're going to Australia. They don't even know what city they're going to for the last minute. So it, it's really a very, it's very traumatic for the refugees, especially those coming to Philadelphia. They only find out the last minute. And um, just to convey a, like the cultural gap or something. So you go to the, re the airport, you pick up refugees, who by the way, many of whom now have never been on a train, much less a plane. So they're boarding a, a bus to a plane, their first trip in the plane, they're getting off at the airport, and they're coming into Philadelphia from the airport. And it's like coming from the moon. And you're looking around at uh, 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 refineries and the lights. And they say, do you have any trees in Philadelphia? I mean, what kind of place is this? And that's their introduction to our city. And uh, I, it doesn't happen in every case. Some are more sophisticated, particularly Iraqis who've been on much more urban and English, but uh, refugees from the camp, it is the biggest cultural shock. So that's how it's decided and it actually works. But that's why if you land in, for example, Fargo, North Dakota, in the, in the airport at the Burger King mall stall, 
tall, dark Somali. And you say, how did they get here? Well, so state said in the monthly meetings, we have 66 Somalis who want some. So Catholic Charity says, I'll take three, and Pai says, I'll take four. So some, and, and Catholic says, and I, and I have a church who can put two people in the house in the basement. And so then Somalis are sent to Fargo, Laotians are sent to Minnesota, Vietnamese are sent to uh, Orange County, California, and Louisiana to be fishermen. So you walk in West Philly, there's a bunch of Cambodians, and that's because of highest and other resettlement agency. It's that horse trading thing that happens once a month. And eventually, when their community gets settled, we then have a process to send for relatives, so, um, which is a lot easier. So we have what we call local ties, which is the, uh, and once the State Department is aware that there's a local family member or a local tie in Philadelphia, um, they will resettle the person here and they'll have a family support group. So now, after the initial resettlement, you go to the airport with 20 people, you know, the six extended families there in the local. So that's very moving. But the first res people resettle, that's very difficult. And different cultures deal with it differently. Um, so, for example, the Iraqis who are coming are much more urban, much more educated, and they are less likely to come in droves to the airport to meet their relatives. Um, more traumatized in some ways. So it's very different. So it's very interesting. Uh, again, I think this work is very interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. And it involves policy, it involves uh, human donations of furniture, it involves everything. Okay, I think I would like to thank our uh, panelists for a very interesting discussion. all for coming um, and it was appropriate to end with the emphasis on interdisciplinarity which plays out in many terrains. Um, I want to invite you to our next event which will be the 21st of February. Uh, Professor, Professor Hiroshi Motomura of the UCLA Law School um, will be here. Um, for those of you who are doing CLE or want uh, or know people who want to do it, um, this is another opportunity to do your uh, CLE. Uh, and we have a very interesting roster of events for the rest of the semester, including a conference on immigrants and urban revitalization on the first Friday in May. Uh, so please go to our website, check out uh, our events, and uh, uh, please join us again. There's a sign-up sheet uh, out by where the food was if you want to be on our mailing list, if you are not on it. So please do that, and uh, there's probably a little extra food left if any of you are hungry. Finally, if you're doing CLE, the papers are in the back. Uh, you can take care of that. Thank you. Thank you. That was really